Welcome to the Artivism Workshop with Tim Siebels. And um, thank you all so much for being here for day two of the 1619 Education Conference. We're really excited to celebrate the work of 1619 contributors and our education partners with you. Welcome to the Artivism Workshop with Tim Siebels. I'm Hannah Burke, a Senior Program Manager with the Pulitzer Center's Education Team, and I'll be supporting today's workshop. I'm honored to share space with Professor Tim Siebels, a brilliant artist and longtime educator himself. After a brief introduction, I'll turn it over to Tim to lead us in an examination of the power of poetry and art for social and political change. But before we get into that introduction, Tim, can I ask you to just share your own welcome with folks in the room and introduce yourself? Oh, absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Siebels, and I am absolutely honored to be a part of a workshop dealing with art and activism. So wherever you are, I'm hoping that we'll find something of use for you. Amazing. Thank you so much. These are our goals for this session today, so you can have them in mind. Um, we're hoping that we'll begin to cultivate a little bit of a relationship um, around the 1619 Project with the Pulitzer Center and with one another as a community of educators interested in better understanding this work and using it in our communities. We'll be reflecting on artivism and the relationship between art and action, resistance and hope exploring a little bit of the literary timeline from the 1619 Project and how it functions as part of this um, relationship between art and action, maybe exercising some of our creative muscles and thinking about how we can write this kind of poetry and create this kind of art ourselves. And while we'll be sp spending the majority of our time today um, talking about, um, talking about uh, the, the project itself as creators and as learners, we'll ask you to just consider the application of artivism to the classroom for yourself and how this can affect your own education practice. So please share your reflections and your thoughts on that as we move forward. Um, and we'll have that in mind uh, as part of our education conference today. Please use the Q&A anytime you have a question that you wanna ask during the workshop and uh, the chat function to share comments, responses to questions from Tim um, and, uh, and any reflections that you wanna share. Our chat is limited uh, to being visible to only the hosts and panelists today, um, but we'll be sharing select comments out with everybody to make it more in depth. You also have the option to enable closed captioning if that would be helpful to you. And a reminder that your registration link will be the same for the entire conference if you're joining us for future events today, but the webinar will close after each event. So to rejoin, just click that same link when it's time. To start with a brief introduction to our conference and to the Pulitzer Center, um, the organization uh, organizing this conference uh, raises awareness for un of underreported um, global issues through direct support for quality journalism and a unique program of education and public outreach. We're here representing the Pulitzer Center's K-12 education team, where we have a mission uh, to um, create resources and programs that cultivate a more curious, informed, empathetic and engaged public by connecting teachers and students with those stories and the journalists and artists who cover them. So our idea of this theory of change, uh, moving from the journalism into uh, the, the action and the education piece is to think about how raising awareness and creating the storytelling model can not only lead to um, better knowledge, but can equip us and empower us as community members, as teachers, as students, to inform ourselves, to cultivate empathy, and ultimately to take action in a way that's meaningful to us. Pulitzer Center journalists investigate all kinds of different issues um, and uh, their intersections. And everything that you see on the screen here and so many other things um, are related to the kinds of issues that are explored within the 1619 Project. Because you've made your way into the room today, we know you're familiar with the project, but it's easy to forget just how expansive it really is as it continues to grow and evolve over time since its first publication in August of 2019. There's a print magazine uh, that contains essays by so many different leading journalists and historians, as well as beautiful creative works and photo essays, a broadsheet, a kids section for K, uh, for K to eight, um, a five episode podcast, two different books, an illustrated children's book, and a long anthology, including new and revised um, essays and uh, poems and stories, as well as the brand new 1619 Project docu-series on Hulu. 
Today, we're really here to talk specifically about one element of this project, which is the 1619 Project Literary Timeline. This, um, this workshop is going to focus on the creative works in the form of poems and short stories that compose a timeline of key moments and figures within US history. Contributors to the timeline were given a spreadsheet with an expansive list of options and asked to choose one to respond to to depict in their writing. What you see on the screen now is a literary timeline from the New York Times Magazine publication of the 1619 Project. So I wanna ask you all to just take a moment with these, look at the events and the names that you see on the screen and ask yourself whether anything is new or unfamiliar to you. And please share that with us in the chat if you're seeing any names or if you're seeing any, um, any events on this timeline that you haven't explored in depth before. I'll leave that up on the screen. While I also share with you um, this revised and expanded list, uh, the book-length 1619 Project Anthology, A New Origin Story, contains almost all of those original works, but also 21 new works by preeminent writers. Perhaps you recognize some of these names, which include former U.S. poet laureates Tracy K. Smith and Natasha Trethewey, major leaders within the Black arts movement like Nikki Finney and uh, Sonia Sanchez, as well as brilliant writers who are also scholars, educators, community builders, and winners of all kinds of different prizes. Of course, these contributors also include our incredible workshop leader today, uh, Professor Tim Siebels. I wanna give a short introduction before I pass things over to you. Tim Siebels is the former Poet Laureate of Virginia and an NEA Fellow, as well as a Provincetown Fine Arts Center Fellow. He's the author of seven books of poetry, including Fast Animal, which was a finalist for the 2012 National Book Award and winner of the Theodore Rothke Memorial Poetry Prize. This was followed by One Turn Around the Sun in 2017. His new and selected collection, Budo Libretto, was released by Etruscan Press in 2022. Of his work, the poet Martina Espada has written, Tim Siebels is a poet of extraordinary sensitivity. His images are luminous, almost unbearably vivid evocations of the world around us, both past and present. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Siebels, and I'm going to turn things over to you. All right. All right. Anyway, I'm imagining that the vast majority of you um, certainly are engaged with teaching young people how to write. Um, some of you, I realize, maybe here just for the being interested in the 1619 project, and I'll speak a little bit about that, but I really want to spend the majority of my time talking about how we might approach writing uh, with our students, for example. Um, and even if you're not yourself uh, a teacher, um, I think if you're interested in writing about political issues, just the act of writing in and of itself is a way to expand your own awareness, even if you're speaking only to yourself. So these are all things um, I think worth, worth keeping in mind. Uh, I was born in 1955, so my coming of age years were defined by social and political unrest. Um, the promise of progressive change uh, and the resistance to such change. And so that, with that as my background, much of the writing that I've done over the years, either directly or indirectly, probably is engaged in thinking about how, this, how the world works for us, how the world works or does not work for us. Um, one of the things, uh, I taught high school for 10 years, uh, eight years in the inner city in Dallas, and then two years in a, in a private school in North Dallas. And uh, so I have some sense of what uh, goes on with the K through 12 uh, life. I was also, I've also subbed at every level uh, of, uh, of uh, primary and secondary education. Uh, my experience though primarily would be from ninth grade to 12th grade. But what I'm hoping is some of the exercises that I'm going to share with you today will be useful even to, you know, someone in first grade. Some of them will be useful in that way. Um, there's, I'm not uh, 
quite sure how to how much I, time I want to spend on the 1619 project itself. I think probably you've seen the timeline and many of you probably have the book. Um, to my sense of things, that's probably not a book that many uh, primary students certainly are going to read. And then even in the secondary world, those are big books with very big ideas and the, the writing is pretty high level stuff. So you, unless you're teaching AP, I'm not sure that book itself is a book that's going to be a text in your schools, though it's an amazing uh, reference book and certainly can, can be used to go into various directions and to find other source materials that maybe perhaps can be used um, in the classroom. Um, one of the reasons I was so happy to be in that book is because in, as with so many things in our social slash political world, so many things go either unsaid or unnoticed or they're forgotten. And that book, for me, and I considered myself reasonably well informed about the history uh, of race and 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 uh, race and oppression, for lack of a better term, in this country. But reading the the book, man, I realized there were immense gaps in what I knew of even figures that I most admired. Uh, I wrote a persona poem. Uh, in the voice of Denmark Vesey, who I feel somewhat familiar with and, and identify with. Um, but there are many, many things in there. And I'm sure you, maybe you found some things as well that, uh, that really surprise you about maybe a gap in your own understanding. Anyway, so I wanted to, I wanted to, to talk about what political, social and political writing can be. Um, there are a lot of ways to think about it. There um, certainly there are complex and uh, you know high, highly complex and deeply uh, um, intricate kinds of poems that deal with the, the social and political realms. But I was just going to read a couple of examples of things that make that inform the way I try to approach uh, social and political writing. Um, this is a poem, uh, let me see. Like this is a, one of the more obvious kinds of approaches uh, to uh, political writing. This, uh, this is a book maybe that some of you are familiar with. It's called The Poet's Companion. If you're teaching poetry in particular, but even writing in general, it's a good source. Um, it's uh, it's uh, editors are Kim Adonizio and Dorian Lux. And it's, this is a book in which there are many chapters dealing with different aspects of writing and also dealing with craft issues too, depending on how seriously your students are engaged in this practice. But this is a, a chapter called Witnessing. And I just was gonna read a little bit of a poem uh, by Bruce Weigel, who was a, a Vietnam veteran. Okay, the storm stopped pounding. I'm trying to say this straight. For once, I was sane enough to pause and breathe outside my plans. And after the hard rain, I turned my back on the old curses. I believed they swung finally away from me. But still the branches are wire and the thunder is pounding mortar. Still I close my eyes and see the girl running from her village, napalm stuck to her dress like jelly, her hands reaching for no one who waits in the waves of heat before her. Now that's just a fragment, but he's simply describing a particular horror that he encountered while, while being a soldier in Vietnam. One of the ways in which uh, I think a simple way to engage um, students at many levels, but certainly in the secondary levels, is to say, what have you seen that troubles you about our society? What have you seen that troubles you about the world? Um, and these are some things, ways I have approached it. Um, you could say, you can write this on the board. 
you can do this exercise for yourself. We'll have a few minutes. I hope you can work on something. We'll see. We'll just see how it goes. I've put on the board, for, for example, suppose there was no blank. And the students have to think about something in the society that they don't like or that makes them sad or angry. And the next line is, then I would, you can do it that way. You could also say, if there were no blank, then we could, there are lots of ways. And this is a simple way of starting the piece. You're not going to get a wildly intricate response right away, but it's a starting point. And for me anyway, uh, one of the things that I believe we're trying to teach um, our students is that language matters, how you think matters. And because our thoughts are made manifest primarily in words, you have to say the thing that you know is true and what you feel is true matters, right? And you have to, and sometimes we take for granted that students know that, but in my experience, they don't necessarily know that, hey, what you think matters, what you say matters. And so that's one of the ways I'll begin, just what do you, what do you wish there was gone from this world? And you can, you can shape that in a million ways. You could say, what do you wish would stop in the world? Why? That's just, and they can answer that. Then if you want, you could follow up with it. Could you write a poem about it? You can do that. But these are starting points. Um, there's another one, a uh, one that gets a little bit closer, trying to make the experience a little more personal. I write, whenever I see somebody being blank, it makes me angry. Once I saw, once I heard, and then they go from there. And that way they can talk very specifically about their own experience with racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, sectarianism, whatever it is that they encountered that hurt them or, or troubled them in some profound way, they can begin to make it about their own lives. That's one, another approach to getting them um, more engaged uh, in their in their, you know, in their society, like basically, I suppose. I mean, once you start to realize that your life in some way is defined for better and for worse by the ways in which your, your society operates, um, it's important for them to begin to articulate uh, their relationship to certain issues that make the society function or not function. Um, anyway, let me read you something else. So this is, a, this is there are a couple different ways to approach political writing. Um, here's, I'll read you the beginning of one of my own poems. Um, I'm using, I'm playing with the idea that the poem can be a character in the poem. And this is a little, this is a little more highfalutin, but it's a way of playing towards serious issues. The sun shone like most days in May and some senators stopped to watch the smoke thicken and twist in the unsteady wind. A few pointed, others half smiled as if unsure exactly how to feel. Even though it was on fire, the poem sat stone still in the street even with the acrid smell, even as the poem's face turned to ash and fell away. Most thought this was just one more trick, a well-played trope setting up the poem to make another impossible comeback, raising its fists, traffic be damned, bearing its breast, saying what poems usually say about war, about sex, about the way this country packs its maw with black bodies. But the poem sitting in the lotus did not blink or move or seem to notice the unhappy cars, the well-fed White House lawn, or the curious tourists aiming their phones for a selfie. 
haze in their hair, heat wrinkling the light behind them. The poem didn't say why it turned to fire for its final word. Maybe it was just sick of all these years getting up, getting dressed, getting dressed, tuning its throat, only to find itself disappeared in America. Jabba the Hutt, commander in chief, filling his cup with drool, and still the raucous cheers, still the red caps rallying like a virus. And you can probably tell that poem was written during the previous administration. Um, and that's more like a more frontal approach uh, to the issues perhaps of racialized thinking in this country, racist thinking in this country. Um, the idea that the country itself is eating black people, um, which is force is metaphor. Um, and then this is a quieter poem and this is the thing, what, what interests me uh, so much about um, writing uh, that engages the society socially slash politically, is that it doesn't have to, to yell necessarily, though it can yell. And this is a poem I wrote recently recalling an incident uh, that, that involves race um, that I experienced as a child that I think really redirected or made me reconsider certain things about race, white people in particular, because even as a kid, pretty early on, you're already being, you're already learning how to stereotype. You're already learning to see people in terms of color rather than in terms of their character. So this is a poem and it's called Riddle, just Riddle. When I saw the forest, it was late afternoon. The sky held the color of something almost forgotten. I pulled off the road, found a gravel path sloping toward the trees. It had to be the light that remembered my last Saturday at Y Camp, freshly husked corn roasting on the cob and all the nervous cicadas calming down for dark. Because I didn't know the handle could be hot, I burned myself pulling a skillet from the fire and was cursing quietly when a blonde boy I hadn't met told me to put my fingers in his milk. It's okay, he said, won't hurt as much. I was 12 stuck on the step between childhood and puberty, just starting to understand that I liked being alone and trying the riddle of a person who might turn into an adult. At the time, I did not have these words, but on this drive, I'd been wondering about what I've become and how I live in this country. It all came back, the red and white carton with the bent straw in it, my fingers starting to blister. Then the white kid's shy shrug of a smile. In the forest, it was already night. Now for me, that is also a political poem. Um, but it's, it, it has, it's using a softer register uh, to make its point. Um, it, the poem is about uh, a transformation in the perspective of the speaker. Um, I was, uh, I integrated the schools in Philadelphia, me and I guess a few hundred other quote unquote colored kids back in 1964. And we already had stereotypes. I remember very clearly going to the, the new school with very clear ideas about who white kids were and how they were not to be trusted, right? And so this poem is, involves a kind of social, personal transformation in the larger social context. Um, and that's something else that can be useful too when we think about things, uh, writing poems that we might consider social and political. Um, 
that allow the students to, to address their own particular understandings of how one thing, they knew one thing at one point and then a particular incident changed the way they thought about it. Um, again, as we think about this in writerly terms um, and academic terms, we don't, as much as I would love, love it to be so, we do not think that the vast majority of our students are going to become poets, fiction writers, or novelists, or uh, essayists, or memoirists necessarily. What we really hope is that they'll all carry forward a deep interest in literature and its potential to change their minds or to at the very least expand their sense of the larger world. Um, and so what I try to do and the way I try to, to push them to see a greater value in language is once you get to a point like, you know, I wish there were no blank in the world and you get them to say why, then you, then you try to make, get them to write more concretely about things. Say for example, this is an exercise I also use. A day without blank would be like blank. And there'd be five of these similes, just as a starting point. So they would say a day without racism would be like a mountain of popcorn. I'm just saying that just for the hell of it, just because uh, they could say it, that'd be a good thing, right? A day without prejudice would be like a feast of, of French fries and, and chili dogs. It doesn't matter what they say. The idea is for them to tie an idea, a general idea like racism, like sexism, like homophobia, like any number of the other uh, forms of prejudice that infect our world and to connect it to a concrete image. So they move from the general, like an idea like racism or sexism or classism, and they tie it to something very particular. Now, this, this has worked pretty well for me in two ways. One, it lets the students play. They could in fact say a day without racism would be like a, a mountain of popcorn, fine. I don't, it doesn't bother me. Um, they could also say a day without racism would be like an open field filled with daffodils, which is a little more lyrical and serious. Um, but the idea is they begin to, to see that to write effectively, you must move from the general to the specific, the general to the specific. You go from a, a general idea to a concrete example. And that's just be a way to begin that discourse. And of course, if you want to start a poem that way, you can. A day without homophobia would be like a, a carnival where everyone wore feather headdresses, whatever. Right, and then you could play from there. You could go from there. That's another possible exercise to think about writing and being engaged with uh, through poetry, and uh, to to make to try to make a statement that connects uh, the political to the personal, and allows students to feel their own involvement in these issues. So here here are some other things that I've worked on uh, that I've done over the years. Certainly, if you're dealing with sophomores, juniors, seniors, even freshmen, perhaps in, in my school, and even maybe younger, it depends on, on, on how much time you have. Um, you can have students try to find someone in history with whom they identify. It doesn't matter. It can be Dr. King. It could be Malcolm X. Um, it could be uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. It could be... Uh, you, know, you name it, you know, anybody, Kamala Harris, if they want to deal with someone um, living. And then what would come, I would ask a question, for example, if they picked Kamala Harris, let's say, what would Kamala Harris like to say to everyone off the record? And so you're inviting the students to imagine what does she really think about you know, the situation we find ourselves in with regard to 
any number of things, war, peace, white supremacy, sexism, whatever you think. Um, whatever they might want, wherever they might want to go. And so that's another assignment that can be, you know, gives them a chance to imagine into someone else's mind. Um, one of the, the important features, uh, or one of the important ideas that were highlighted, one that was highlighted earlier um, involved the idea of empathy. And so if you, if, when you imagine into someone's mind, you're obliged to some extent to identify with them and some of their issues, right? Or to at least recognize the possible validity uh, of an issue in this or that person's mind. Um, so you could, for example, also write, what would Donald Trump like to say off the record? And then a student may be, uh, may be obliged to identify with a figure that he or she may not particularly like, um, or they may, in fact, like Donald Trump. But you get them to begin to get inside the head of someone else, particularly any figure, any figure at all that seems to have real bearing on how things are in our society. They're either for, for better and for worse, you know, what, however that might work. Um, here's a, a different possibility too, in terms of how we might approach uh, political writing. I've asked this question at all levels. When did you first realize your color mattered? When did you first realize that your color, I'm putting it in italics, mattered? Write a poem it can be a narrative poem or it could be a short story. If, if you're teaching story writing, for example, you could, it doesn't have to be a poem. Write a poem about that moment or incident. Was there a particular moment when you thought, oh, I'm being treated this way because I'm white, black, brown, red, yellow. It, it, was there an incident like that? And most, for most kids, by the time they're, whew, gosh, seven or eight, Usually they're, they're saying, oh yeah, I remember already. Um, but the older students certainly would have a moment like that. I've used this at the college level as well. And all of them have a moment when they're like, oh, of course. And this also is another way of moving them to be more deeply involved in the discourse you know, of the society. How does it work? How does it not work? How is it... Uh, how is it a pleasant place to be, you know? And how is it not so pleasant? And to the extent that students begin to think more directly about the social issues that impact their lives, to that same extent, I believe they may be more inclined toward continuing to care about how the society works. This would mean, of course, they would be more inclined to vote less inclined to stay home and, and say, ah, it doesn't matter. They would be more inclined to say, oh, when something is done that is unjust, this has something to do with me. They'd be less inclined to say, well, didn't happen to me, so I guess too bad for them. You know, to the extent that we can develop an empathic sensibility in our students through various kinds of writing, to that same extent, we make the society a little more sane. At least that is the way I've approached it. Um, uh, the other thing you can, you can write, if you want to move away from issues of race, there are many issues. Um, when did you re first realize that your gender came with rules that you had to follow? Write about that moment. When did you know that being a girl meant this, being a boy meant that? And what, what, what was that moment like? And, you've, and I have found really interesting tales coming out of that. Um, also, something I wanted to say before I forget <laughs> to say it, I always do these exercises, or I should say almost always do these exercises with um, my students. Um, because of course, I. I'm dealing with the same issues that they're dealing with. Now, sometimes I've already written about uh, the issues, but I would say to you as, as fellow teachers, um, by all means, 
uh, wrestle with your own past and your own experience as well. This does two things. One is um, it, it lets you see more carefully and more clearly into maybe the kinds of wrestling or the kinds of struggles students are having to say something about their own lives because you would be struggling to say something about your life. The other thing in terms of the classroom dynamic, you become more, for lack of a better term, real to the students. Because I think I do think students imagine us to become somehow separate from everything. We just teach ideas. We're not necessarily affected by these issues. We're just trying to tell them how to think or what to do or what to read. But I think when you begin to write, you know, do the exercises with them, they begin to see that, yeah, yeah, Mr. Siebels or Mrs. Johnson or Mrs. Uh, Johansowitz, she's wrestling with this stuff too. So you, you build a bond, a classroom bond between yourself and the students um, and, and perhaps increase their capacity to empathize with you as, as a teacher. And again, when we, we do things uh, dealing with specific incidents in the students' lives, uh, you would say, so what were you wearing? Was it cloudy that day? Was it raining? Was it cold? Was it summer? What month was it? You know, and, and this, in this way, you can continue to press them for specific ideas, specific imagery, specific things. Um, and this does, of course, a few things. One is, of course, it makes more real their own sense of things. But in addition to that, it begins to develop an understanding that for writing to be effective, it has to involve real specificity. It's got to be really exacting. And so that inclination toward lazy writing is, you know, is, uh, is confronted by the need for an exact image, a, a very precise description. You know, the person who said such and such to you, what did their face look like? What color was their hair? You begin to, and then that way you build the poem, build the story and so on. Um, lastly, um, I, I was recently, I was actually recently in South Africa um, for the funeral of Myrtle Vitboy, who was the woman who began what has now become a global, uh, a global movement um, for the uh, ju just for the just treatment of domestic laborers. Um, she is the president, or was I should say, the president of the International Domestic Workers Federation, which has nearly a million members now. She started this this. Uh, this movement in her in a garage. It wasn't her garage. It was the woman she worked for's house and garage. She started it with just talking to a few domestic laborers uh, in Cape Town, and now it is global. Um, and so you can also have students pick a figure. For me, in the uh, book sixteen nineteen, it was Denmark Bessie. I picked a, a poem in which he would speak. Now I invented what he said, but I did it through research by researching his life. Um, this poem, uh, which I wrote, wrote not too long ago, it's also rooted in research, but I also knew Myrtle Vitboy. I met her. Um, she was very close friends of my, my beloved ladies. And, uh, and so I, I wrote a poem in her voice. Um, I'll just read the first stanza. I know where time is getting short. I say over and over the same things. Sure, domestic workers are people. How do you not see us? You think we don't have husbands, sons, daughters? You think our parents don't want us home for Christmas? You think we do this dirty work because we have nothing better to do? Shame. We take your children to the park. Our children like the park. They need sunshine too but we are not with our children. And so the poem goes on like that. And so the more, the more I, I, of course, research uh, domestic labor issues, particularly in South Africa, um, the more engaged I became and the more I realized how ignorant I was about people who do work in other people's homes, for the most part, do, are not treated like regular 
laborers. They're not, they're not protected the way regular laborers are. And so I learned something through the, the researching her and also through meeting her. I would suggest that your, your students would also learn a lot. They pick somebody from history. As I said, I talked earlier about Kamala Harris or anyone, you know, have them write a poem in their voice, you know, make, make a poem in, the, uh, in someone's voice. You've got, to, you've got to think differently if you're putting on someone else's head, right? You've got to see differently into the world, right? Because I am not a domestic worker, but writing a poem in her voice made me sense or see more clearly the issues that she and many other people are wrestling with globally. And what we're trying to do as writers is always to maximize the sensitivity and the intelligence, the intelligent engagement with the larger world of our students. At least that's what I wanted to do. I don't want a bunch of students who write well, who don't care about anything. You know, I want them to write well and have their writing be perhaps a vehicle for engaging with the, the society in one way or another. So that's, those are some thoughts I have about political writing. Professor Siebels, thank you so much. I hope you've also been seeing the gratitude for you in the chat um, and many folks saying that they wanna try out these prompts um, with their students or on their own. Um, and thank you for grounding us today as we kick off our conference in the importance of all of this work and the words that are produced as part of the 1619 project, leading us to greater empathy and to potential action. So to close us out today, folks, um, I just want to, uh, to remind you um, that uh, we can hold on to these kinds of questions as we move forward, thinking about artivism during the rest of our conference weekend and um, in the rest of our year. What is the relationship between art and action and how can artivism inform your personal practice as an educator in whatever space you're working in, as well as as a human being? Uh, we certainly have um, a lot of resources on the 1619 Education website that make use of um, the beautiful works in the, in the literary timeline and have inspired a lot of beautiful student work. So I'll highlight this one, um, just recently published by a new member of our, um, of our current education cohort um, who used the full model of uh, the 1619 Project to lead students in thinking about resistance movements, especially within Afro-Latinx communities, and producing their own essays, photos with captions and illustrations, and original poems in response to um, events um, and, uh, and cultural resistance in their own communities. So check this one out. I'll also highlight from last year, um, this beautiful unit by an educator in um, an African-American uh, history class in Philadelphia, whose unit culminated in an analysis of poetry from the literary timeline which served as a model for students in developing all kinds of different artistic memorials that honored the contributions and resistance of enslaved Black Americans. So a lot of material to check out as inspiration for your own coursework, um, and we hope that you'll continue to think about these kinds of questions as we move forward with this, um, with this conference and in our education years. So again, thank you so much for joining us um, for this workshop and huge thank you to Professor Siebels for the wisdom and the beautiful words that you shared with us today. Um, we hope that you'll continue joining us for the rest of our conference. The next panel is the 1619 Artists where you can see Professor Siebels again alongside other brilliant contributors to the literary timeline, as well as Kimberly Anise Henderson, a photo curator for the project, uh, speaking about their work there. Um, that panel will start at 1 p.m. Eastern, and we're hoping to see you there. In the meantime, if you feel encouraged to share your learning um, and takeaways from this panel, please feel free to use that hashtag, Teaching1619, where we can be in community with each other and um, see our responses to this work um, and to connect with other attendees and participants. We also encourage you to consider applying for the next cohort of the 1619 Education Network. Applications will launch this week on our website and in our education newsletter. And none of this work would be possible without our incredible community of donors. So please consider supporting this work and the Pulitzer Center mission by visiting pulitzercenter.org slash give. So thank you all so much for being with us. Um, thank you, Professor Siebels. We hope to see you at the next panel on artivism. Um, so uh, take care in the meantime, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>